Uh, this is Anthony from MakeWeirdMusic.com. I am here with Dale Turner, multi-instrumentalist, instructor at Musicians Institute in the guitar program, and all around pretty decent looking guy. <laughs> Well, first of all, I must say that I'm deeply offended because I'm assuming by your very presence in this room, you're implying that I make weird music that hurts me deeply. Give me a break. Thanks to Carl King Creative for the gear to do this and for engineering and being an all-around decent-looking guy. <laughs> <coughs> all right, we've started this thing off with a bang. Um, Dale. Anthony. <laughs> what is your, uh, what's your story? How did you get started with music? Oh! Well, my uh, parents always had tunes in the house playing, but I, I know what got me motivated to like try to be an instrument playing person was uh, two people named David when I was a kid. One, my uncle David, and uh, two, uh, an- another David. <laughs> One. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what the hell happened? <laughs> They can't both be your uncle. <laughs> One, my uncle David. I have a million uncle David. Another guy. <laughs> another guy named David. Like, of course. I have like a shitload of uncle Davids. <laughs> I'm totally serious. <laughs> I got so many fucking uncle Davids and uncle Bobs. Okay. <laughs> Two guys named David. <laughs> No one's gonna find this funny. <laughs> Two guys named David are sitting in sitting in a in church. Oh my goodness! Okay, All right, let's try that again. So, what got you started? <coughs> what got you started with music? Uh, well, I know what what started me wanting to play stuff was. Uh... <laughs> God damn it! Now I can't even say David without just fucking myself up. I totally didn't even think that was funny. <laughs> Because I, I see no humor in the name. It's not the name. It was just two guys named David. One guy, my uncle David, <laughs> and the other, um, another guy named David. It's like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> she male. All right, so, so two guys named David. I'll just fucking do it. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Somehow. <coughs> Be a nightmare now. This is the worst interview probably <laughs> ever done. That's the best. <laughs> Shit. Okay. This is Anthony with MakeWeirdMusic.com. Uh, I definitely want to keep frog, frog voice in there, though. Just keep it rolling. Yeah. All right. I'll just, All right. I, can, I can say it. Yeah, how did you get started with music? <laughs> Let me leave the room for this. <laughs> Okay. Uh, my uncle David is. A <laughs> I'm, try- I'm not even looking at you. Maybe we should skip that part. <laughs> I'll just come back to it later. God damn it. Sorry. 
<laughs> I could just fucking talk through the laughing though and just be fucked <laughs> up. Yeah. Why not? Here we go. <laughs> You're gonna think we're all high as fuck. <laughs> okay. Oh jeez. <laughs> 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 So your your parents had instruments or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> what happened? Oh, the microphone is way down there. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> I, All right, here we go. Yeah, let's just hear from the beginning. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. So my uncle David. <laughs> It's my safe word. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Some great chemistry in this room oh my today. God. I'm fucking tearing up. <laughs> Now I feel like I got asthma. Uh, my uncle asthma. <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can do this. All right, I'll do this, but since I already said my uncle David, <laughs> without any noise, you could probably... I'm not going to laugh this time. It's this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be just as guilty. Right. So because I already said his name, mm -hmm. I'm going to not say it. Okay. And I know that'd be an editing pain in the ass. No, that's fine. But probably, that's fine. I'll just go, play the drums. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fuck it. Here we go. Ready? Microphone. There All right. I uh, was in a cover band in downtown Seattle. And I remember getting to sneak in to see him at a bar when I was, I think, in first grade or younger and he was playing drums and singing and when I heard him actually do a play and sing a Beach Boys song a song that I actually knew already and seeing an actual person that I knew being the performer it kind of freaked me out and at the same time uh, another fellow named David <laughs> <coughs> another David uh, was a piano playing badass and I used to always go over to you know for family gatherings over to their pad and I saw him ripping through Flight of the Bumblebee but like a boogie woogie version of it oh, yeah. and so that motivated me to you know can I have piano lessons so I got piano lessons and that kind of set me down the road to mucking around with the music thing <coughs> so was piano your first instrument and it sounds like at a pretty early age six or seven a fucking chair <laughs> sorry how much of that chair can you hear in the mix i, I won't move <laughs> right <laughs> i won't breathe uh it's cool <clears throat> ready yeah um, 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 um yeah i think that was in first grade when i started piana and I bashed on that all the way up to seventh grade, if anybody cares. Fifth grade, I started trumpet, played that all the way to the end of high school, then picked up piano again. Well, picked it up, you, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. <laughs> started bashing on it. I was really ripped by the time I was in 12th grade, so I picked up piano. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Uh, anyway, and then got back into that. But uh, guitar started happening when I was 15. So, and that kind of took over because it's sort of hard to rock on piano. I mean, you could somewhat, you know, the yeah. synthesizer keyboard thing, but trumpet was kind of the opposite of rocking. So, plus I got braces, which trashed my trumpet chops. Mm. So I just went gung ho on guitar. And that was that. And uh, <clears throat> was the guitar an instrument for you to compose or just to perform or you know what what were you doing on the guitar at that age uh the first year on guitar i did take lessons for that very first year and i started you know learning chords and some scale type of stuff at some point but after that first year i quit <clears throat> and uh just started 
making up riffs. I always made up unaccompanied solos because I kind of worshipped a lot of those guitar mm. beasts, you know, playing their two-minute eruption type things. And I hilariously still have a million of those on tape. Like every month or something, I would make up my own little eruption. Oh, wow. It's pretty goofy. And that was kind of all I did on guitar for quite a while. But, you know, then started figuring out solos and songs of other people and jamming along and playing with a drummer friend of mine, Dean. And then we started kind of writing some rock songs. And that was kind of the first time I really interacted on guitar with another person. And that was that kind of brought it to the next level. And when did you start making music, recording it? Hmm. <clears throat> Composing. I think the first song that I, well, I had this cheapo acoustic guitar that I did make up goofy little songs on, and I had a cassette recorder how did I do this? I think I had two cassette recorders, and I remember I would play one part into the cassette recorder and then come up with another layer of it, and somehow I'd end up with a two-track thing of this little cheapo acoustic guitar, <clears throat> and I had a few songs like that, I remember, and they're all named after different girls. <laughs> mm, of course. <laughs> In uh, like high school. And uh, yeah, one of them was the Monica song, but we don't have to go there. Mm. And then, but I think my first real, well, I guess they were real to me, but I, I did write a song in pian on piano. It was sort of a dirgy thing. <clears throat> and, uh, but I think I might have, I was probably kind of a late bloomer. I have no idea as far as the songwriting thing. Uh, I just wanted to get good at playing an instrument, but I still was trying to, you know, be creative on it as well at the same time. Like mm -hmm. I try to do, sort of my own arrangements of other songs in live bands or adapting keyboard parts and other stuff to guitar. So it was always trying to do something a little extra, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it, at some point, <clears throat> I moved down to Los Angeles and, oh, I totally spaced out. I was in a few rock bands, of course, up in the Seattle area. But it was mostly me contributing electric guitar parts and stuff to another, you know, other guy's songs, just trying to beef them up. And so I, maybe I learned a little bit about metal, you know, you know, through right. that experience or something, yeah. which is kind of what I was weaned on anyway. You know, Dio, you know, Maiden. <clears throat> I think I was at Queensryche, that kind of stuff. Right. So those are inf inf those were influences for you. And you're playing in some bands in Seattle. You end up in L.A. Yeah, and I did the uh, you know music school thing, which was fantastic. Where did you go? Uh, USC, oh, okay. actually, for four years. Totally, totally bitching. I initially was had my sights set on you know trying to be a studio guitar person, you know, um, or side person you know, touring goofball. But at some point I got way into wanting to be Pat Metheny, hmm. kind of, you know, or not a bad so guy something either. like that, which obviously didn't happen. But I really went into the instrumental, uh, I don't want to say fusion, but it was jazz influenced, tasteful tunes. Right. But that, you know, the, the songs themselves were great. Like Matheny's songs are freaking amazing. Plus the the playing, and I that was always an inspiration to try to kind of meld the two. I didn't really get into vocal songs until quite a while, other than joke vocal songs, you know. Right. Uh, but nothing serious until way down the road. Um, and over time, tried to kind of integrate my interest in yodeling, I mean singing, and uh, you know diversity of guitar approaches. And you know, Iron Maiden influenced songs. Yeah, <laughs> can't 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 escape the Maiden. <clears throat> how many how many official releases do you have? Have you played with bands and released albums? And... <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> I'll count that as one. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> 
totally forget. That. Can you do that again? Sorry. How man. many releases have you performed on? Like, have you played with other bands, or have you only done solo work? It's not too much stuff. I did a, a one acoustic guitar quartet CD that I'm I'm on that was really fun. I was in David Pritchard's acoustic guitar quartet for man maybe f- five or seven years and we played live a lot and i did get to do one recording which ended up it's actually on a warner brothers subsidiary which is n- kind of neato um and then a bunch of cds that just went with instructional books that i started to get involved in that was a whole other you know goal R- instructional books with audio so did a lot of that kind of recording which in a way was cool because it forced me to learn how to record and that coming from kind of the backwards angle is partly what got me more interested in another type of writing i i guess once once i actually writing yeah yeah songwriting thank you um because I was already writing, you know, for right. instructional books, and I, I I forget if I'd started writing for magazines and stuff by then. But when I got a hold of a recording system that enabled me to layer parts, that actually got me way more motivated to compose and flesh out ideas. Mm. When prior to that, it was always you know boombox land, which is still songwriting, you know. Right. Because right. a song doesn't have to be a billion tracks for it to be a song. That's but the constraints are very different. Yeah, I guess it just made it a little more exciting to hear something that sounded less crappy. Right. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but I like now, I have a whole stupid thing in my head that I think is at least important to me, the difference between songwriting and production. You know what I mean? Right. So many people get enamored with the stylization and the production elements of a song versus spending a crazy amount of time on just the craft of songwriting. And they neglect, you know, the t- real nuts and bolts and variety that really makes a song be a song. Right. Versus just all the textural, you know, ear candy stuff that you hear that n- makes something sound interesting, but when it bo- when you boil some things down, you know, strip away the production and the stylization, the song might not really be, you know, as much as... You know what I'm saying. The second Seal album comes to mind. Uh, the <clears throat> second album by the artist Seal um, with Trevor Horn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Trevor yeah, Horn's production. Yeah, what a badass. I just remember thinking this album is incredible, and then I started learning the songs, and I was like, "Wow, these songs are so simple," but mm. he turned them into just incredible works of art. But behind it is still a normal song, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that is. That's a thing that I started to kind of notice a lot. I know I was telling Carl this. Can I do that? Yeah. <clears throat> Carl's here in the room. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, from when I was transcribing for Guitar World for a billion years, that was another job I had. You know, part of your the, the gig is to write out songs that are, you know, flavor of the month, chart top, and tunes. Mm-hmm. And from doing that over, and I was already doing like regular full album stuff, so, but this is this specific, you know, singles market type transcription thing. And I started to notice in a sh- ton of well known modern, in quotes, songs that if you just remove the d- percussive aspects, you know, the drum track or whatever production that was generating the groove, it was like freaking bare bones and right. minimal two chord stuff, which started to actually really really bother me so i started to really try to not be dependent upon you know the the ear candy stuff right and at least just try to really you know develop in areas that make a song at least as you know whatever level i'm able to freaking achieve uh somewhat interesting versus just you know you know the two or three chord thing which is super cool, right. but I just now I, I can't freaking write a song that has two or three chords. So now I'm all I'm all fucked up. <laughs> and how did you end up with those <clears throat> professional gigs? I mean, you end up getting published in magazines that are sold 
all over the the country and you're writing transcription books and doing lessons and writing songs in the style of and whatnot how do you end up with a gig like that yeah that was a trip that was uh it was actually pretty crazily calculated i I mean i didn't really know how it was going to unfold but i had very specific goals uh, way before I was interested in songwriting, again, getting kind of going way back in time, I knew I didn't suck at transcribing, actually, and I also really liked it. And I always was impressed by, you know, from being a fan of guitar magazines for a million years, oh, wow, how do these people know how to write this stuff out? You know, all that kind of stuff. So I, you know, wanted to learn how to do that. That's one of the many you know, things that sent me down the path of trying to get musically literate or educated to the point where I could write stuff out, uh, which doesn't make anybody a good musician. It's just a technical thing. But I was way interested in that for whatever reason. Uh, and at some point, I really tried to get a job doing that. And that took a while for that to materialize. Then once that finally materialized, uh, at some point, one of the companies that I worked for, I guess thought I wasn't a complete idiot and they because and they, most people agree that I am mostly an idiot that's uh, yeah, but there's Carl portions of me his head and I'm also not yeah, yes me- mega idiot megidiot and uh they a- it asked me if I wanted to like I don't know if audition is the right word but send in a few writing samples analyzing the music of Steve Morse who happens to be one of my all-time favorite freaking musical beasts incredible guy <clears throat> totally so I uh, wrote out a whole an analysis of a bunch of his riffs and you know pieces and things and sent it in, and they're like, okay. And so the first book I actually got to write was on the style of Steve Morse, which is a jackpot blast for me. So I started doing a lot of that kind of stuff for this company, which ended up, through another inroad, hooking me up with a separate company, which eventually gave birth to its own guitar magazine, Uh, which was Guitar One that I was West Coast editor of for, I guess, 11 years I was with that magazine until it got killed. But prior to that, I randomly transcribed an Albert Lee video, and the guy that was interviewing Albert Lee in the video, uh, Oscold Buck, randomly remembered me years later when he was working at Guitar World and... uh, said, hey, that guy was sort of not horrible at transcribing. So then I got hooked into Guitar World that way. And all that stuff kind of all happened, kind of, I don't want to say snowballed, but one thing definitely fed into the other. And I definitely had a goal of transcribing, yes. Writing instructional books, yes. Instructional content and interviewing, you know, some of my all-time favorite musical heroes in guitar magazines, yes. And each one of those things started to kind of happen over time. And it was cool, and I learned a lot. Can I suggest a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Should I ask a question? Ask I have a question. This is Carl King speaking. Oh, yeah. I just, I'm wondering why you wanted to do that instead of being like a guitar god on stage in limelight. Why were you attracted to the behind the scenes? To, to nerd them? <laughs> Actually, I know exactly how to answer that. Because uh, initially... When I did move down here, I had a very clear idea what I wanted to do. And then that changed. But then I was interested in so many different things that I wasn't 100% interested in one thing enough to devote myself to just that one thing. So I wasn't really sure anymore what I truly wanted to do. But I knew I wanted to at least find a way to employ myself that I could also learn at the same time while I figured out what the hell I wanted to really do. And that's really what made me kind of bash on that. I mean, I certainly, I really wanted to do that stuff anyway. And in a way, it was a little more than I wanted to play because I... I didn't, that, that's actually not true. Because at the same time, I was in several bands while I was doing the transcribing stuff. I was still in that acoustic guitar quartet. I was in two different rock-oriented bands. I was in a 
blues and R and B cover band. It was a bunch of stuff, and I kind of liked all that, but it wasn't enough for me to you know get fourteen roommates and live in a small apartment and say let's just give it a, give it a whirl, you know that kind of thing. It just for whatever reason it, that type of thing didn't didn't appeal to me by this point in time in my life, you know. Not where I am now, but, you know, way back then. And uh, and another bizarre thing, like, at some point, I, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but I had a ton of friends that were the type of guitar player that were like, all they want to do is jam and play and play. Oh, God, blah, blah. You know, they want to play all the freaking time. They're, and part of me started to view the guitar playing, music making part Maybe this was after being in a bunch of bands that all kind of didn't really work out. It's I started to just make the guitar thing be just a more of a personal thing. And so I just, I don't know, kind of didn't go that other route because of that, I guess. Did you consider uh, yourself at that time a full-time musician? Or did you consider yourself a writer? You know, what was your, What would you have called your trade at that point? Yeah, that is kind of a funny question because I, I still have a weird time even saying, you know, oh, I'm a musician. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, for two years, I had a full time job that was kind of in the music related, but it was more like a, a an organization that booked classical and jazz and world music acts in a bunch of venues throughout Los Angeles, including the Orpheum Theater and other uh, crazy venues that were historically or architecturally significant i used to do the marketing and crap uh-huh. for them um <clears throat> and then at some point i started to teach at usc at night guitar the first time i remember like labeling myself though i, th- I think i was calling myself a m- guitar journalist which was kind of weird uh because i was writing a lot about guitar or maybe it was guitar transcriber slash journalist, transcribing a bunch of things, but also writing about a bunch of people and interviewing, you know, some of my favorite peeps. But you weren't producing your own music at that time, were you? Not, no. I, but I was still doing the stuff I was saying, the goofy thing about, you know, recording instructional CDs. Sure. But yeah, none of that was like, you know, I made another album, you right. know, that, at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I to- total late bloomer. Like I was yammering earlier um and in a weird way it's possible that uh part of what got me motivated to get into the uh, more deeply into the songwriting thing was i mean a combination of a reaction against stuff that i noticed was that that was driving me crazy plus stuff that i really liked plus a bunch of hand injuries that made it a little trickier for me to you know, unload lickage. I was doing a uh, Joe Satriani instructional CD, and I, in the middle of it, fried my hand and got the carpal tunnel fun. Uh, so I kind of couldn't play for a while, and then getting back into playing, I wanted to get to 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 uh, at least feel like I was making music so I got way more into playing and singing at the same time but really doing it in a technical way since I was already always trying to develop technically on the guitar when my hand was destroyed I could really only play basic stuff but the technical ability to sing and play complicated rhythmic relationships I really tried to go deep into that Partly because it was, you know, to keep that challenge, you know, and feel like I'm developing. Uh, but I also, around the same time, got way into Jeff Buckley. And uh, that, all that kind of stuff at the same time, I think, started to 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 uh, present a little bit of a detour from the path that I had been on previously with the borderline wannabe guitar jock thing. And now, okay, I'm done soloing, apparently. <laughs> You know, try to use the guitar as a, a, a in another, you know, for another purpose. I guess. <clears throat> so, what started you, or what started your compositional era? What 
what was the transition like from where you were then to starting to write and record your own music? And you retained all those jobs throughout, right? Well, the the, the cool thing about uh, in a way, I look at this as a I don't I don't want to say the you know blessing you know that word, but uh, the fact that I was not deriving my livelihood from shredding did make it possible for me to keep going, you know. So I'm still interviewing a you know all sorts of favorite guitar people from any you know any playing style you know Ingve, paul gilbert buckethead but then john frusciante chris cornell t- tons of people way over 100 guys so i still got a you know i'm still surviving monetarily and, and in a way getting inside it at least trying to get inside of the head of those kind of you know those freaking world-renowned artist beasts s- sort of did a little bit of something internally maybe i i don't know i it was some kind of motivational when i when i would interview some of these people that were not the shredding mutant beasts uh john frusciante in particular would be a was a big I- inspiration because it was really obvious to me how he just stripped away every freaking thing from his life that didn't relate to being in the most creative frame of mind possible at all times he didn't freaking drive a car at all he was always as relaxed as possible which i'm not (laughs) but uh it was just it was interesting just kind of being around those kind of people brian wilson i got to interview a couple times which is brutal for me uh i think i'm getting off target at 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 some point i I mean I, i was i did start writing songs that were vocal oriented a little like a teeny bit before my hand imploded there's other shit that happened too but i can't i don't know if i should say it because it involves mostly i'm just crutch oops i'm interested in getting from the getting the story from when you were just starting out to tunesmithing yeah and particularly the what i might call unorthodox music like on um mannerisms magnified only in that it follows normal song structure but there's all sorts of interesting rhythmic stuff going on the chords are not there's hardly like a one four five moment on Mm. the cd you know um so in that respect you're you're making music that's not uh, that doesn't just cater to people's normal expectations, but it's great music that is very much you, but perhaps at the expense of, I'm not just going to make a formulaic song that you're going to hear on the radio and make, you know, try to hit, make get a hit. I want to make music that's meaningful, but people will like it too. Oh, thanks, man. Hmm. <laughs> uh... But I, I, I would think by the time that recording came out, since I'm definitely, you know, not totally young, <laughs> uh, I think with all the uh, different jobs that I had prior to, you know, really starting to feel some drive and momentum and creative feeling connected with song making uh at at some point i tried to take the the acoustic guitar and kind of use it as a a little bit like a piano player would sort of because i was always interested in solo guitar playing you know like arrangements of popular songs that work just on guitar whatever uh so after my hand was trashed, but I still was, you know, doing my regular work connected with the musical universe uh, and the Buckley fandom that I kind of mentioned earlier, I did start to learn a bunch of co- cover songs, and but try to tweak them kind of in the way that he he always did. I mean, not not like he did, but any 
performance that you'd hear of Jeff Buckley doing a cover song, it was totally not him trying to cop the original. There was so much of the wealth of influences he had throughout his musical life and his own unbelievable uh, improvisatory ability all funneling into his performances that I I really, really uh, got inspired by that. So first thing I did is I, I don't even know how many songs, but a, a, a huge number of songs that I always liked as far back as I could remember, I tried to work out ways to make them be cool to me on guitar and voice. And uh, at some point I recorded a bunch of them but just to give to my mom for Christmas, and this is way back. This is actually, I think, 2000. And uh, so that's that was just a live thing I recorded, actually right here where you're sitting, and uh, me singing and playing at the same time. Because that, like I was saying, that was a thing I was trying to get into, the rhythmic independence and that whole challenge. So four years after I gave that to my mom... Uh, I had given a bunch of other copies of it too, to uh, just some pals, and a couple of them were like, "Dude, you should maybe think of like I don't know, put this out," because there's a couple goofy things on there. There's a guitar, guitar vocal only version of Bohemian Rhapsody that's sort of funny. There's a pretty cool, I think, version of God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, just guitar and voice. So in 2004, I finally put that out. And that actually would be the first release that I slapped out there myself, just called Interpretations, because that's basically what it is. And there's liner notes in it, actually, where I kind of tried to briefly describe all the different little tweaks that I tried to do, you know, meter changes, feel changes, uh, a bunch of songs that were piano, but adapt, adapted to guitar. And there's even a version of Hallelujah that I did that was obviously inspired by Buckley, but I tried not to totally blatantly rip it off. But anyway, so that was that was the first thing that I would say would be, you know, oh, I'm an artist now, even though it's not anything that I created other than the arranging, you know, personalizing that I tried to do with those other songs that I just loved. Was that released by yourself or did you have a distributor or something like that? Oh, I did the full-on independent okay. thing. I mean, I started Intimate Audio, which is my, you know, quote-unquote label name, and that's also my website, IntimateAudio.com. But the birth of that whole thing was, I was also fascinated by people that made music 100% by themselves. And so in listening to records like that, uh I felt more intimately connected with them as artists. And uh, that that's part of the, the I don't know, what, what's the word? The uh, motivation behind, you know, creating intimate audio, the site. Way back, it used to be a forum that I, I had a, you know, message board and I made a little radio station. People would upload their songs. This is even before MySpace. And I would do a little review of their songs, you know, stuff that they recorded at home, played all the instruments themselves, that kind of stuff. I had a streaming radio station. And it was pretty cool. But once MySpace came out, it just made it kind of pointless. Plus, it was really, it was kind of a lot of work doing all that stuff totally by hand. It was not automated at all. So anyway, Intimate Audio was kind of, kind of about that. Uh, and then... Yeah, I just went through CD Baby, Amazon, iTunes, the normal path that anybody can do nowadays, which is pretty cool. So, Mannerisms Magnified, that was the next release. That's right. What what was your motivation to make that album, to be the one playing everything? You know, basically you did everything except for manufacture the the equipment you used. <laughs> To make it and uh, <laughs> to funny. produce the album, right? Yeah, that was that was a <laughs> really stupid idea. <laughs> now, it was, I, I think that, that get, gets back to that whole intimate audio mission kind of thing that I guess I kind of got into from uh, being into records by Elliot Smith, Todd Rundgren, John Bryan, Joseph Arthur. I mean, there's... Th- 
like the first Paul McCartney solo album, uh, even Phil Collins. <laughs> yeah, but tons of records out there where one person did everything. And I, I was always, I mean, being impressed by that doesn't necessarily mean the music is good, you know? But I already like the music of a lot of these people. Stevie Wonder, there's some records where he played almost everything. Prince. There's Len, a, Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, exactly. And actually, on my goofy website, I even have a whole section on there uh, called a tab for multi-instrumentalists. And hilariously, the first album on there is uh, by Greg Wells, who I would have to, if, if, if I could... Uh, mentioned it was a big influence on me trying to go that multi-instrumentalist route. A million years ago, I auditioned for Greg Wells' band that at the time was called Silas Loader, and I failed miserably. I mean, I didn't get it, but uh, I guess the, the, the tour never happened anyway, so I didn't miss out. But uh, the, the crazy thing is, he was, I believe at the time, Katie Lang's drummer. He... Uh, played every instrument on his record it was on irs records he didn't know at the time that that label was about to go bankrupt and the whole thing imploded but the record is freaking awesome i learned half of it in like two days or i don't even it was super quick which is a bonus of me being a transcribing psychopath learning it in the car as i'm driving you know doing my business um and uh Anyway, I'd never heard a... I guess the other records that I mentioned were not necessarily rock band records. They were other styles. But this was an actual rock record where one guy played everything. And so that always kind of was a, a uh, I don't know, blueprint in some form. And freakishly, years later, I started to notice... I mean, he always kept busy, but he's... I started to notice co-writing credits of him showing up on Aerosmith Records. Now he's like produced Katy Perry, wrote some stuff on the latest Adele record. He's a freaking huge monster, to- total badass. Um, and he still, you know, is playing everything. Pretty, pretty inspiring guy. I mean, I don't know him at all other than, you know, he was really cool way back when I got to actually play with him for that attempt at being in his band. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer of at least part of what maybe planted the seed for me trying to muck around in that area. At some point, you had to decide, I'm going to write an entire album's worth of material, and I'm going to perform every instrument on it, and mix it, and do all that, you know, engineer, (laughs) do all of it. Um, Was there a... A deciding factor in that or it just kind of organically happened well i should back up a little bit and throw this out there is part of the other reason this this whole thing for me trying to go that direction which I, is a direction i'm still on in my new mix of tunes that i'm doing i'm torturing myself in the same idiotic way you know 12 or 13 more songs writing and playing everything that whole same thing But I do know for sure from having been in a bunch of bands, none of them were huge, but everybody wanted them to be successful, and every single one of them imploding for one reason or another, or some kooky flavor of the month stylistic change would happen, or something that just made stuff, I don't know, time and again, I just decided to stop, and At some point, I did actually know what I wanted after a million years, and I just figured I'd just try to then do it myself because I was sick of the drama, I guess, and issues. And uh, so that that was another thing that made me decide to just try to be a self-contained, you know. I I didn't realize at all, though, how... (laughs) how challenging and brutal it would be, especially in three key areas, the drums, which I, you know, do real acoustic drums, and uh, the lyric writing, and the the mixing aspect. And even in the end, in that mannerisms magnified, I still had a a guy bail me out with, with the mix big time. 
But those three things were things I didn't foresee as being just a colossal time suck. But also, in the same way way back that I said, you know, well, why did I want to get so into transcribing as a job and all that? I guess I part of the learning junkie in me did want to learn more about drums, learn about mixing, you know, all those different hats, trying to wear them. Uh, it's certainly not making a, me a worse overall musical person, you know what I mean? Um, and at some point, you know, I, I kind of would like to to be, this is kind of a fantasy, but John Bryan, which is J-O-N-B-R-I-O-N, is a is a uh, one of my top four, I guess, biggest musical inspirations like possible. For for a million years, I only had a list of three. I mean, there's a billion beneath the, the top three, but top three humongous ones. And I recently slapped him up, not recently, quite a while ago. Just a unfreaking believable all around force. Who's who's a film composer, singer songwriter, multi instrumentalist producer uh, i've seen his live show a million times at largo and even when cafe cafe largo moved to the cornet theater where he plays everything and totally does solo shows where he's looping himself on a real drum kit making up songs on the spot doing medleys i've seen him do all of the who's tommy by himself uh he, I, well, all these weird noises So at some point, I part of me also think, you know, ha- my motivation was always to do it, you know, for my own musical projects. But, you know, I might, in- I think I would enjoy also augmenting other people's tracks. And I did actually a few years ago with a, a fellow that I used to have record here. Uh, I played drums on his stuff and produced his record. Uh, that was the only full band recording I ever produced here, but a, a bunch of other singer songwriters i just would record like guitar vocal demo stuff but anyway cool so what what is next for you then <laughs> scary sounds hmm? what can you hear that shit what yeah, what is that? It's pine needles falling on the roof. Oh. Or some kind of stuff. Did we... What are your next steps? You say you have 12 or 13... Oh, yeah. ...more songs <clears throat> that you're working on? Let me just blast through some crap real quick, I guess. Cool? Do what you want. Well, I did try to spend two years really promoting Mannerisms Magnified, Uh and I, you know, got a lot of good ink, you know, good press, which is certainly cool. And played a little bit, but then I had a whole other uh, hand issue develop, which resulted me in having, needing to have freaking spine surgery. So that kind of s- slowed me down a little bit and then had two babies in the midst of that. But e- even during that, I, s- I started to already you know, slap together some new tunes for Mannerisms Magnified Part 2. No, I mean, for for another recording. And so I got another one that's brewing. Thanks for asking, man. That's uh, probably going to be another thousand years, but it's 12 or 13 tunes that uh, some attributes would be similar, I guess, to the previous thing where there's some acapella vocal things. There's... Uh, most of them stem from acoustic guitar, but I layered a bunch of electric instruments on it. This one's way more electric guitar heavy, though. And uh, some of the songs are weirder and a little more rock-oriented, I guess. Uh, but I, I don't really know how much how much more time that's going to take. I can say that I've done all the... Because I, I should tell you this just because it's silly I, I usually record all the acoustic guitars first for every song and then electric bass for every song and then electric guitars another ear candy for every song so i pretty much already did that for these 
I got to do the drums and then finish some lyrics so that I could do the yodeling and then of course mix but I have no idea how long that's going to take hopefully next year but I have no freaking clue <laughs> that's awesome but thanks man I, I can't wait to freaking throw throw them at you <laughs> the I usually try to end with um you are a full-time musician would you recommend to others <laughs> a p- the path of a of somebody who strives to make real music that has unorthodox qualities, you know, weird music? Um, what would be your advice to somebody who says, I've just got this style and it's my own and it's not pop rock, it's not going to be on the radio most likely, you know, how, how do I approach that? That's what I want to do with my life. Yeah, then start start building it. <laughs> There's a, I mean, w- whatever it is that you do musically, whatever market you, I mean, I hate to even say the word market because it makes me hurl thinking about that word. But however you classify yourself in this day and age, it's irresponsible, I think, to not have some foundational form of income that hopefully relates to you know, the area that you want to have your brain swim in, you know? So as long as you got that handled and you are able to carve out free time, you know, some people have issues with procrastination and all that stuff. Obviously you got to fight through that, but just, I mean, you got to, I think this is probably where you meet, where, where you're going you got to please yourself first, you know what I mean? Any real song in the last billion years that people hear as being like, you know, revolutionary and amazing and game-changing and like birth of style or whatever, uh, those people all are just doing what they wanted to do. They weren't like, oh, if I mix a little bit of this song and then I I could take the groove of this song and then, oh, I'm going to pick this subject. I mean, sometimes lyrically people will pick subjects that are, you know, accessible, but just please yourself first. And if you don't have enough of a self to begin with, that's a problem, kind of. Because I, I I have a lot of songwriting students that uh, that I do catch trying to chase a trend, which. The only time to me that that's cool is if you're high, doing a work for hire thing where somebody needs you to write music that's like this or you know you're if you do get in a position to be doing you know film composition video game music you, you already got parameters set for yourself and that's killer you know but uh I I do regularly see a bunch of people constantly changing their minds in the same way I got to think that like freaking Chinese democracy, (laughs) the Guns N' Roses record that took 15 freaking years, to me that's the same type of wheel spinning hell he must have been putting himself through. Because in the amount of time when that record started, there was industrial rock, then corn came out, somewhere in there there was a whole big sky, violently different trends, end over end over end. And I don't know exactly what you know the first five years of Chinese democracy sounded like, but I would bet that there was blatant, you know, j- genre jumping. Tr- I mean, that's dickish of me to say, but that kind of thing. I think you just have to flush down the toilet if you already know what you want to do. If you don't, then just as long as you're chasing something, you're going to grow, and pieces of little things that you sample or tap into style wise will be part of your eventual musical makeup and then as you get closer you you won't even know it until all of a sudden you like look back and go holy shit i really actually do like specific stuff and i really actually kind of do have a feel that i'm climbing towards some kind of sound you know what i mean um if, if you're in a position right now where you like like a bunch of different things but are not really sure of which one is the greatest, 
that's good. Just try to get really good at all those different things. But at some point, you're going to notice two different things. What you truly are the most cut out to do, that you're kind of the naturally the best at, and then the other would be like what you really ha- actually love, not just kind of sort of like. And then once you start to f- get closer to figuring that out, put all your eggs in that basket and uh, try to grow in those areas. And that's when you're going to be hopefully making some freaking weird music. Cool. Thank you for for all your time and perspective, context, all that. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, man. Pro- okay, bye. <laughs> we didn't even talk about Vi. God damn it. Oh, well. Is he a big thing for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? I mean, everybody has been. But yeah, I was telling Carl, I used to vandalize my school with his name and shit. Wow. All sorts of crap. But, I mean, in a way, though, that kind of got me interested in weirdness. Steve Vai stuff. I mean that yeah part I don't know. I wanted to hear some of the specific ways what elements are you making your weird stuff. You know what I mean? I know what you makes mean. your melody weird? Like how do you go about doing it? Because you, you say you're into weird music. Right. You just said that so how do you yeah. Can I insert a couple things? Of course. Yeah. Just uh, some foundational weirdness? Yeah sure. Like looking back what kind of things of course. Do I attribute to, or what might it influence some yeah. uh, affinity to weirdness? Yeah. Do you absolutely. want to? S- what are some things that attribute to your affinity to weirdness? <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you. I just made it up. <laughs> All right, on. Yeah, crazy thing. Like, uh, I was weaned on cartoons. I always freaking loved Bugs Bunny cartoons. I kind of didn't really like any other cartoons. It was all the Warner Brothers stuff. And a billion years later, I realized that, like, I think it was Milt Franklin and Carl St- Carl Stalling were the music guys for that. And uh, so I was always being pounded with that cartoon music. I always loved John Williams, um, who, who's... That's what Carl said this morning. Oh, really? I interviewed him. Oh, John right on. Williams got him going on music. I wouldn't say John Williams is weird, but but uh, no, but powerful. Yeah, and there's a difference between the stereotypical film composer that's got the classical foundation versus somebody like John Williams that's a thematic freaking beast. Every single thing that he's done, it doesn't sound like scales and arpeggios in some kind of chord sequence. It's a obvious theme and i know just from loving all those movies that got in there star wars a bunch of that music is clearly influenced by stravinsky way down the road i got way into stravinsky i also got way into bartok i got way into chopin so a lot of that started to i guess get under my skin in a way that would at some point influence me gravitating towards certain sounds uh, also, way back when I was a kid, I used to listen to Spike Jones records all the time, who, if some people don't know, he's a 50s era big band guy and a percussionist that hilariously, uh, I think Mel Blanc was even in the City Slickers, if I'm not totally on acid. Uh, if you check out any of their recordings, it's a bunch of goofballs just going off with percussion instruments and weird voices. So I know a lot of that, I mean, this is like single digit age because my... Uncle David, <laughs> and uh, my dad had those records and stuff. Um, so that was in there. And then when I became a complete guitar spaz, I uh, came across Steve Vai. And initially it was the movie Crossroads, which freaked me out. But then I heard the first David Lee Roth album, which just completely blew my mind, which led me to getting his flexible record. And when I heard that, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I literally worshipped that guy for for quite a while, to the extent where I kind of, you know, damaged some desks and bathroom stalls in, in his good name when I was in high school. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I still love all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I think so that, that left of center sound that I was always fascinated by, uh, compounded by a ton of other stuff, later had to have had some kind of 
you know, influence, at least opening me up to be able to sit in a position to chill out, listen and absorb and be moved by, you know, some heavy, heavier stuff, I suppose. I can't remember if I was going to say anything else. Was that retarded? No. Are there specific ways that you make your music a little bit weird instead of normal? Oh, yeah. Can you ask that? Are there specific ways that you make your music weird instead of sounding normal or boring? (laughs) Don't be calling my... There's a lot of throat clearing in your music, isn't there? (laughs) Fuck it, I couldn't do anymore. Uh, Here's a thing that I've uh, kind of started to talk quite a bit about with a bunch of my I mean I feel weird saying this but songwriting students but I do have several freaking songwriting students it's really fun you are a teacher at a music school so I would hope oh, yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I guess that's I, oh, I forgot about that yeah that does help and truthfully that's another way to you know I teach music theory at a freaking music college musicians institute my head is constantly swimming in stuff all the freaking time and the more you mess with that stuff and have it in your head uh the easier it is to analyze stuff you hear that you stumble across and absorb and so but a thing that i do encourage my songwriting students to try a place i try to get them to get to which i know is what i did with myself and it's always trying to you know improve obviously is if you can take any number of what you would say are your favorite songs uh, and at some point be able to describe in real actual terms what it is you really love about the songs. And I don't mean, oh, the melody is really nice. That doesn't explain anything. (laughs) At some point, I had several realizations in a row. And, uh, and, and And none of these realizations were the re- the reason I liked them. Like I didn't go, I didn't r- read something in a magazine and go, oh wow, this song has that, so now I like it. This is song, these are songs that I loved for years. Way after the fact, I started to go, well, why in the hell is this song giving me goosebumps in this one spot? And every time, it would be a, a non-diatonic chord in that one little spot, some kind of sneak attack, non-diatonic chord. Usually when somebody tries to analyze what's happening there, they'll, they'll go, oh, I really like the melody and kind of there. Well, what it is is that one melody note, the way it resonates in relation to the surprise chord is the reason you're getting an emotional re- reaction to it. So, I, well, that means I got to get better at using non-diatonic chords in my own stuff. That was one. But even before that, I realized that to me the key to having non-generic music has to come from the chord progressions. It, unless we're talking about just purely production, stylization, textural elements that make it interesting from just, you know, sound design. No, it makes me think of Chris Cornell's album Euphoria Morning. Like, every, every two to four beats, he's changing a chord, and he uses diminishes, and or diminished, and like half diminished, and tons of sevenths and augmented chords and it's very much like all the, a lot the lennon mccartney stuff um just the whole flavor of chords instead of just really simple stuff like flutter girl oh yeah totally you know, every in the verse every two beats is some weird chord and you're like how does he think that think that way you know yeah, and that was the one single for that album actually right? hilariously that you mentioned that that and I know this is, you know, people always say, well, you know, you're just stuck in the past, man. Well, that album right now is inside the CD player in my car. Right. That exact album. I listen to that album all the freaking time still. I interviewed him for that album. I interviewed Alan Johannes, and the band Eleven was the rhythm section for that whole album. Uh, I recently even hilariously did a little, you know, text back and forth with alan johannes only through like a kickstarter type thing because he's releasing another solo album and he's a crazy 
musical genius guy, I think, that's unheralded to some extent. Amazing guitar player, plays a billion other string and woodwind and brass instruments. Amazing songwriter. Anyway, I'm kind of getting off. But there's so many people out there to be inspired by. It's just ridiculous. But uh, yeah, so an album like that, the songs, clearly, the majority of them would be him with his guitar. And then the production aspects, the ear candy, the layers of guitars, the treatment of the voice throughout is what starts to stylize the songs. So with that in mind, I I tried to, I guess what I'll talk about though, for what Carl's asking maybe, is a crowbar separation between elements that contribute stylization and production versus just pure core musical things. Um... And, and, and that would be getting back to the whole chords thing. Um, and I, I think it, part of it was like, if you listen to just, you know, Nevermind, you know, the second Nirvana record, all those progressions are like, I mean, the vast majority of them, you know, the melodies are great, but part of the reason the, the melodies are great is because they have chords dropped underneath them that are, you know, just oozing with the, the curveball thing. So all that kind of stuff at the same time, and these are just two of several ingredients, but okay, you come to the realization that it's not really the melody, it's an interesting chord sequence that might inspire a melody, that's one thing. So I decided to go down the path of trying to create more interesting chord progressions. A separate realization was just the surprise insertion of non-diatonic chord. Another realization, I started to notice a crazy amount of my favorite songs every section was in a different key the verse would be in this key the pre-chorus would be in this key and the chorus would be in another key which generated a constant uptick in musical drama so okay well now i got to get better learning you know figuring out how to do key changes then i started to notice a lot of the songs that i like have a great flow to them so then I started noticing, wow, this song has seven measures wow, in, in the verse. This one's got a nine bar thing, all these asymmetrical elements. So I tried to make myself be open to not being super symmetrical. This one chord might be held an extra beat. So it's a five, four bar that helps, you know, a little bit of a change up to, to help keep stuff from being bloated. So all these little things I, I started to notice, including subtle use of odd meter, uh, and just trying to get better at all those kinds of things. Uh, I'm trying to think, of, just off the top of my head, beyond those core musical things, there might be other things that I would consider being more production and stylization. I started to notice, like, because I've like worshipped the Beach Boys, if that's okay, since I was five. That's all I freaking listened to for, for years, from until, you know, Kiss, since I was a little kid, you want to... Um, and f- for example, every chorus to the most artistic Beach Boys songs, there are three totally different vocal parts. There's the lead vocal, there's a counter line, and then there's some kind of pad or rhythmic chanting vocal thing. And these are songs that I already loved, and something about those appealed to me, so I started to try to get a little bit of that in there. Uh, but but e- even even more so, like just the tracks to those more arty Beach Boys songs, the instrumental interplay or counter lines between you know an instrument line with the vocal. I was way got way attracted to that, so I wanted to try to get better at that in my own stuff. Uh, I liked weird background vocals like King's X. I was way into with a cluster. I mean, still am with the cluster vocal harmonies. Way into Bobby McFerrin. Way into. Mr. Bungle, all, all sorts of stuff that the the influence there would be maybe less structural to some extent, but a little bit more of, you know, vocalizing stylization things that I just liked. So I guess the, the thing I'm trying to say that, that I try to work with songwriting students is if you can get a list going from analyzing songs you like and really in a specific way be able to describe and pinpoint what you actually like those areas are what you want to get better at and it could be 15 things like i have a list for and it it is at least that i just can't think of stuff off the top of my head and as you get better in each of those categories and it could be from like you know a million different styles of music 
the way all that stuff gets reassembled is going to be what your style is, really. Because if it's all stuff that you love and you're getting better at all those individual little areas that you love, then that has to be what's going to make you know up the somewhat the end result of your you know tune smithing. That is really cool. <clears throat> is that kind of me? Kind of yeah, sense? I love that. It's my favorite part of the interview. Oh, sweet. Good stuff. But just don't forget the whole other aspect, though, is the instrumental. You know, the, the this. I really want to make sure people get the difference between that kind of stuff and the stylization, production value elements. Because there's so many people I see get trapped in the. You know, I'm going to use all these loops and drag all this crap in off my hard drive, and you know, program all this MIDI textural junk. But when it still comes down to it, it's still a you know one you know basic chord progression doesn't mean it's bad but if you if you are trying to get into heavier more you know weird stuff there's ways to be weird without it just being the result of sound design right yep cool yammersmith odeon thanks again dale do you have any more questions carl all right no, that I was awesome another thing What's your other thing? I'll just say it if you want to nuke it. It would be totally tied Just say it. Go shit. ahead. Don't say it. Spray it. <laughs> <laughs> no. The thing about music. Like a, a similar thing. This is a, just a kind of offshoot of that same thought of, you know, people getting enamored by sound design, which is bitching. I would love to be able to have textural elements like all that cool stuff. Hopefully... Which truthfully is the thing I'm trying to do with my newest thing. I'm trying to have interesting structural songs, but then try to go, you know, hopefully similarly weird with weird guitar sounds, weird ear candy business. Who knows? Wish me luck. <laughs> but uh, I, I see also all, all the time people fall into the trap of like, oh, if I do all this, you know, I just tune my strings to some weird stuff on my guitar and, you know, it makes me write better. And nine times out of ten, those people that are the the uh, open tuning mutants, still the same basic preschool chord progressions. They just sound different because of the resonance of the open strings. It's very rare, unless you start to really evolve in harmonic territory, to get beyond your influence of the same normal stuff, even if you're tuning to the same, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. Rare exceptions would be Joni Mitchell. You listen to Joni Mitchell, billions of different tunings, completely not run-of-the-mill diatonic chord progression stuff. Very artistic, amazing. And so she's you know, got not only the interesting guitar sound, but is not restricted by influence of just, you know... And Michael Hedges, who we were talking about before we started. Open tunings, but really not just falling right back to the same attraction to the generic sounds that would still probably result from if he tuned standard. He's really always, you know, reaching. Anyway, I just want to fling that in there because I see that all the time. And it, kind of a shame. Yeah. D denial. Doesn't mean the songs aren't good. It just means you're, you're not really doing anything you wouldn't have been doing on a standard tuned guitar. Right. Anyway, that probably made me sound like an asshole. No, no. The rest of the interview made you sound like that. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Can we do okay, bye? Well, that's my sign off. I know. I'm stealing You're it. stealing it. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, bye is the sign off? Yeah. Okay, bye. KY? <laughs>